I decided we needed to use a little Latin since we're at Columbia University. So uh, this, uh, this research project was basically born out of um, a desire to look a little deeper into um, how we operate as audio branding providers. Um, the barometer last year and this year was really exciting to see some baseline data. But I kind of wanted to take a look at going just a little bit deeper to see if there were anything that was starting to emerge uh, in, in the realm of best practices for us. Because the industry's fairly young. Um, my background's in psychology, and uh, I see a lot of parallels between the development of psychology as a discipline and the development of audio branding as a discipline, where psychology basically started out as uh, kind of a, a, a spiritual, almost mystical practice. Um, and as we got into the age of uh, enlightenment and empiricism, uh, studies were starting to be done, uh, and you had different schools that began to develop uh, that were all somewhere on this continuum um, between faith and reason um, and uh, with audio branding, art and science. So um, I wanted to take a look at basically um, the fact that there's a real buzz happening with audio branding. Um, I, every morning, I usually spend at least an hour to two hours doing nothing but surfing the web, uh, taking a look at what's happening out there. And um, I'm beginning to see audio branding popping up in uh, trade magazines, in financial uh, magazines. Um, it's, it's talked about more and more. Um, and with that, uh, it seems that now everybody's starting to do audio branding. Um, I think since I have put out the survey, um, there are five new companies that I've found um, that uh, talk about providing audio branding services. Uh, so that was an interesting phenomenon. And as an audio branding provider, um, I'm always interested in seeing how we stack up, um, not only competitively, but um, what we're doing to contribute to um, the development of audio branding as a, a, a discipline. Um, I wanted to move beyond the demographic profiles and really take a look at what some best practices might be. Um, and so in order to uh, get at that, what we did was um, we developed a self-reporting questionnaire. Um, we had 32 questions. Um, that looked specifically at four categories. One was basically just a company profile. Um, the reason I wanted to do that was actually to compare it with what was happening with the, with the barometer, to see if in my sample, um, if uh, it played out the same way that the, uh, the barometer barometers did. Um, wanted to take a look at strategy, see how these audio branding providers were approaching strategy. Wanted to look at execution, and finally, wanted to take a look at evaluation. Um, with few exceptions, um, we attempted to scale um, all of the items into kind of a standardized five-point Likert item list um, that would kind of help us um, categorize everything at the end. We had a few open questions, and some of those were specifically designed um, because we didn't want to put um, uh, folks into a box where they had to check off um, predetermined things on a list. We wanted to see what would happen if things were a little more free form, um, how people would respond. Um, we also included some control questions um, just to see uh, if uh, within surveys if there were discrepancies that, uh, that arose. Um, the problem with questionnaires, self-reporting questionnaires, is that um, you assume that people are going to be honest in their responses. Um, so we wanted to put a couple of things in there just to compare um, uh, back and forth uh, to see if there were some changes with the variables. The participants that we chose, um, we took, uh, developed a list of 127 audio branding providers across the, across the globe. Um, 
We took uh, those from lists that the Audio Branding Academy had. Um, we took those from colleagues um, that we interviewed. Um, and we also simply Googled. Um, if it was a company that said we do audio branding or sound branding or sonic branding or music branding, um, we put them into uh, to our provider list. Um, we weren't going to make any distinction um, at that point. We were simply looking for companies that said, this is what we do. The, we had a response rate of 44.9%. Uh, um, part of that was because uh, we ended up uh, sending out follow-up letters saying, we noticed you haven't responded yet, and uh, then actually made phone calls. Um, because it was important to us that we have as large a response as possible from our sample. Um, we found it was interesting, um, there, there, was, there was some concern because we're an audio branding company and we're asking these questions. Uh, and um, we did our best to allay those fears. Um, uh, personally, uh, I think there was a point that was well made earlier today that um, there needs to be collaboration. Uh, and sometimes that may be trading company secrets. Um, but in the interest of research and um, empiricism, I think it's really important that we have some sense of openness with each other where we can dialogue um, about our practices, about what's working for us, what's not working for us, and um, that's why we did this survey. It's not about a competitive advantage. It's really just about understanding when we're talking about audio branding, what does that mean in terms of what we're providing? There was another thing that uh, became very interesting to us as we started to pull the, the surveys together. We, we began to notice right away that there was a distinction um, and uh, we developed two categories that we called higher service versus lower service providers. And essentially what we found was there were audio branding providers that simply provided execution. Then there were other audio branding providers who tend to look at audio branding less as an event and more as an overall process. Uh, so we wanted to take a look and see if there were some distinctions that began to emerge if we looked at companies within these categories. Um, and uh, you know, to give you an example, you would have a company like Sonic ID, and obviously what Martin has done is really high service um, in the, what he does as a provider. Um, interestingly enough, uh, you heard a ringtone for Nokia today that was done by another audio branding provider, Audio Draft, which is essentially a crowdsourcing company. Um, and uh, we've seen two or three crowdsourcing companies that offer um, audio branding in the way of audio logos for a hundred, a thousand, five hundred dollars. Um, and we wanted them to be a part of this survey too. Um, but by creating these categories, it kind of helped us differentiate it a little bit um, in some of the, uh, the best practices. We found that um, in our sample of 127 audio branding providers, 72 could be described as higher service and 55 of them would fall into the lower service category. Um, so there are quite a few companies out there that um, are offering audio branding, um, but are basically offering only execution services. In our sample, the return rate, we had 40 um, higher service companies and 17 lower service companies. So um, actually there was a higher response rate from, uh, from the higher uh, service companies. I'm going to skip the charts and the graphs and the response because if I did that, we would never get through. Um, but I'm more than happy to get you a copy um, where you can see uh, all of our nice charts and graphs and, and uh, uh, kind of how all of these things mapped out. And in the response section, um, we try to do our best to simply report um, rather than to to draw any particular analysis. So for today, what I wanted to do was just 
jump right into the analysis section and just share with you a little of what we saw. And please bear in mind that um, this is, as I said in the title, it's towards emerging best practices. Um, this is by no means meant to be specifically definitive. It's just meant to be something to throw out there that hopefully we can begin to think about and dialogue and, and have a discussion. Um, with, the, uh, with the survey, we had to obviously know that there were some limitations. And as I said, the first assumption is that we're going to believe that everybody responded honestly and accurately. Um, and uh, there's also the very real possibility that language or question order or questions themselves can influence um, responses. It's always the problem with questionnaires. There's inherently going to be some type of bias. Um, we spent a lot of time um, developing the questionnaire uh, and running it through uh, a few sources to take a look at it to attempt to do our best to overcome some of these biases. But obviously, some of that might exist and affect the results and the interpretations. First of all, we didn't make any attempt to suggest one term to define the relationship of sound to brand identity perception. Um, this was a point of discussion uh, in the last session. Uh, should we adopt one term uh, and use that term alone? Um, from everything that I've read uh, out there, obviously these terms get used uh, quite frequently um, interchangeably. Um, actually, our suggestion is use them all in your keywords. Um, even if you prefer to use audio branding, call it everything else when you're doing your keywords. Um, it seems that clients who are buying into it they don't care whether you call it audio branding, sonic branding, sound branding, um, but the search engines do. Uh, so that's room for more discussion down the line. We simply used audio branding because um, that was a personal preference. Uh, interestingly enough, we found that 39.4 of our respondents favored sound branding and 36.4% favored audio branding. So that's actually a flip from the, the barometer. Um, so it's, it's still a little all over the map and the Wild West out there, and I'm sure we continue to have discussions and debates about what we want to call it. What was more important to me was what actually constitutes audio branding. And this, I think, is the real question um, that I don't have an answer for. Um, but. Uh, what we attempted to do, as I said, um, in determining our sample, was to look at audio branding in a broader sense. Um, and we can discuss all day whether it should be intentional or whether it's just accidental. Um, you know, was the Coca-Cola five-tone bum, 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 was that really a strategy or did it just happen to work and they've played the hell out of it and now we know it? Um, does that make it any less audio branding? Uh, if something is simply an event, an execution that's associated with a brand, um, is that audio branding? Or does there need to be a strategy and measurement along with the execution? Um, that's open for discussion. Uh, for the purposes of our project, we're going to accept a broader definition of audio branding, that it's process, and its event. Um, and um, as a result, you can have a lot of companies who are doing audio branding that don't even realize they're doing it. Um, and I can talk about a reel that I have with some wonderful award-winning music and very shitty audio branding because all a client wanted was a piece of music to fit a commercial at that point, no matter how badly I would want to push them to think about strategy. But it's still uh, branding of a sort, even if it's it's perhaps bad branding. Um, again, we saw this emerging category and distinctions of audio branding as a process um, versus an, an event. Um, and so as we took a look at some of the baseline distinctions, 
no real surprises here, very much in line with the, the barometer. Most of the audio branding providers are small, relatively young companies. Um, we might have a little different uh, demographic mix, and you can get the paper and take a look at comparing that with, with the barometer. But no real, real surprises um, there. We did find that um, smaller providers with lower annual billings are more likely to be lower service providers. It stands to reason, um, but I like being able to take a look and say, yeah, it stands to reason, but it's also the results that, that came back. Um, the findings also suggested to us um, that it's an industry that's rooted in providers who derive the bulk of their revenue from the execution of audio assets as opposed to the monetization of strategy or um, measurement. Uh, a lot of uh, the companies um, that we were looking at as we took a look at their history, we saw where they had evolved from many times being music houses um, and uh, an attempt to change with the marketplace, um, they moved into the audio branding space. Sometimes those companies moved in a process way, sometimes those companies simply moved more in an event way and uh, offered audio branding execution in terms of we'll do audio logos for you, we'll come up with a brand theme, but um, no sense of, of strategy or, or me uh, measurement associated with it. Um, also, uh, the findings may, not my, but may, may also mirror an industry where clients perceive audio branding from a lower service perspective, focusing brand resources on execution with little understanding or regard for more strategic or evaluative services. That affects why we as companies are where we are. Um, when clients don't understand audio branding as a process, all they know is, this guy had this little logo, and I want something like that, too. How much does that cost? Um, and uh, when cost is the overriding factor, um, sometimes companies will simply seek out the execution. Uh, so there's an interplay there. Um, and again, uh, I think it's important that you understand when we talk about higher service and lower service audio branding companies, that's not um, a qualitative um, distinction. We're not saying that it's um, good or bad. We're simply saying this is, uh, this is a distinction that we notice. And I'm going to start moving faster now. Uh, the strategy section, which was in some ways the most fascinating to me. Um, higher service providers, when asked, offered a list of services typically thought of as strategic, while lower service providers offered no such list at all. That stands to reason. If you're not really doing strategy, you're just doing execution. If you're asked to list services, you don't really have any to list. But when we asked the questions in different ways, we found out that 41.2% of lower service providers said they offered written audio brand briefs. And 78.6% said they would only provide strategy if asked. Um, and that was kind of interesting because they had no strategy services that they would list. And looking at uh, websites and other collateral material, there's no indication that they had any strategic background. So what's going on here? Uh, who am I to judge? Um, I'm just reporting the facts. 52.9% um, of lower service providers call their strategic process proprietary even if they don't have one, and licensable, um, which was really fascinating to me. And I think a part of this may be a function of the fact that um, the term proprietary may be misunderstood, or the term licensable may be misunderstood. Um, that perhaps a proprietary strategic process is simply I've trademarked a name. Um, everybody else does the process the same way. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting concept when we included these, these questions, that these lower service providers who seem to really offer no strategy at all um, had a proprietary strategic process. Um, 
And as I said, these discrepancies could be a function of survey design, a lack of standardized de definition of strategy, uh, overestimating strategic capabilities on the part of the provider, or a combination of all of the above. And I've already lied to you because I've gone over the 20 minutes, so I'm going to work really quickly now. Uh, on the execution phase, um, what we found that is more time is spent on execution than strategy across all providers. Didn't matter whether you were higher service or lower service, you tended to spend most of your time working on the execution of the audio assets um, rather than on the, the strategy. And as would be expected, lower service providers spent the most time on execution. The majority of providers consider the execution of audio assets a standard part of the audio branding process. Um, in other words, if you're doing strategy, you can pretty much assume that you're also doing execution. Sound design and original music occupied the top of the services list, followed by audio logo creation, soundscapes, voiceovers, and music licensing. Again, close to the barometer, a little difference here and there, but, but no real surprises. Um, and respondents seldom or never employ out-of-house talent to execute audio branding assets. So that was interesting that most of the companies that we looked at that were doing execution, they were doing it in-house rather than, than taking it outside. On the evaluation level, um, the perceived importance of evaluation trailed the perceived importance of strategy and execution um, with just over half of the respondents seeing it as very important. Um, we also found that only a handful of respondents spent more than 25% of their time on measurement. The top three research measures employed are interviews, questionnaires, and direct observation, um, which is interesting because those are also uh, the three that can be open to the most bias. But they're sometimes the easiest to do and least cost uh, involved. And finally, only a small percentage of providers claim to have any proprietary measurement or testing methodology. And of those that did, one-third of those couldn't prove reliability or, or validity of their methodology if asked. Um, so here's some providers who are offering a proprietary um, measurement and testing methodology, but uh, you dig a little deeper and there's no sense that it's anything but junk science. Um, so that was kind of an interesting thing that emerged. And finally, majority of clients seldom or never ask for evaluation or measurement. So that's part, I'm sure, of what's driving this, you know, lack of time spent in measurement. You don't have clients that, that seem to value it enough um, to either do it or spend, uh, spend the money on it. Um, so finally, let me just give you some quick client recommendations um, that I would tell someone who's looking for audio branding. Determine whether the provider is a higher service or lower service provider. That's gonna, gonna determine your outcome. Uh, strategic approaches should involve consultation, market research, training, and or education. Uh, not simply, uh, yeah, I can tell you what you should do. Um, determine if there are any real gains from an audio branding process that is described as proprietary. Clients should expect audio branding providers to deliver audio assets as part of the process, even if it requires that they go out of house for execution. Clients should consider the type of methodology used and the confidence that can be placed in the data. It's the responsibility of the provider to guarantee that the client understands the degree to which they may or may not place confidence in the measurement of methodologies employed. And finally, additional recommendations. Um, I'd love to take a look at a study designed um, to look at audio best, best practices from a client perspective um, and see how that measures up with our own perceptions um, of what best practices would be for our industry. Um, and then um, it may actually be time to think of is there a reason to do a development of a, some type of certification criteria, uh, some type of Better Business Bureau, if you will, for the audio branding companies um, so that uh, we can place more confidence in the services that are being provided. Because if anything, the real danger that I see is uh, confusion in the marketplace from people who don't understand what audio branding is or can be um, because they're simply used to focusing on execution, which is no different from what they're doing when 
they have a commercial and they simply want a piece of music or sound design for the commercial and they're not thinking strategically as a whole. So um, thank you. Um, here's uh, contact information uh, of the offices in Nashville and in uh, Frankfurt and Facebook, Twitter, Vimeo, the blog, um, which I just uh, wrote a little bit about crowdsourcing. So if you want to see what I had to say about that, you can go there. So thank you very much.